he is alive. Amen and hallelujah. We celebrate the resurrection of our wonderful Savior and Lord Jesus. Thank the Lord. In fact, we do it each um, first Sunday. We proclaim that he died, but we also proclaimed, co proclaim in communion that he is alive. In fact, uh, when Jesus met with his disciples um, the night before his death, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and explained that this was his body. He essentially was using the bread as a symbol of his life, the totality of who he was as a human being, and offering that up to the Father as a sacrifice for our sin. And I, I trust that you're prepared uh, with, with us uh, to engage with the Lord in what we're, uh, again, reiterating. This is the Lord's Supper, and it is a fulfillment of scripture. It uh, fulfills, again, um, the reflection of who Christ is and what he came to do. He came to be the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. So we worship him and we celebrate with him in the sacrifice of his life. So why don't you take the bread with me this morning? And Father, we are grateful to you this morning for the great privilege this hour is to know you and to be able to make you known. Each, in fact, Paul said, we declare Christ's death until he comes. So it's in sharing the bread and the cup that we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your death, your burial, your resurrection, and your return. Jesus blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, eat, this is my body, take it and eat all of it. Let us eat together. Thank the Lord for this first Sunday in April. The second component of the communion table, the Seder meal, were the four cups of wine that represented the deliverance of Egypt, Israel from Egypt. Well, the third cup is the cup of redemption. And we're to look at their deliverance out of Egypt as redemption. They were being redeemed by the blood, the blood of the firstborn. Jesus fulfills, he informs that meaning with his own blood. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant, my blood, which shall be shed for you. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance. It's a memorial. And so take your cup. And Father, we are thanking you again for this cup and what it represents, symbolically representing the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We fully imbibe on it. We take it in. We believe that he died. And when he died, he died for us. Thank you once again. This we pray in Jesus' name. Let us drink together. Amen. <laughs>
God bless you, Diana. Wonderful, wonderful ministry and song today. Thank you so much. Thank the Lord for the Lamb and so holy, the holy Lamb of God that takes away, has taken away the sin of the world. He has removed all of the barriers that hindered fellowship with God the Father. And he sets himself up as the access point for entrance into the Father's presence. All who believe can freely access the Father through Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And we're just so grateful tonight, or rather today, that we're um, followers of the Lamb. And thank the Lord that we are, again, are worshiping Him because He is risen. As the angel said in Matthew 28, in Matthew 28, they were looking for Jesus, and the angel said, he is not here. He is alive. They anticipated seeing Jesus wrapped in the shroud, in the death shroud. But little did they know. And to their great surprise, he was not wrapped in the shroud. He was not there but he was alive and on his way again to Galilee. And we, we just thank the Lord for the, the, the testimony of the angels and then the testimony of Mary and the other uh, disciples who came along and said, he is alive. Well, well Father, we are grateful for the uh, power of the resurrection and the, the uh, privilege that's ours to know you. And we proclaim you alive and we celebrate you. We want to continue our enjoyment of life in Christ, the resurrected life. Thank you again for this wonderful privilege. All of the songs that have gone before, the worship, the reading of scripture, and all of the, the testimonies of your people, O oh God, who uh, labor to make you known. We thank you for that. And now we pray that you'll bless our time as we meditate on the the teaching of the word of God, the scripture. Grant, we pray, clarity in our thinking and in our, our um, declaration of that which is true concerning the risen Lord. This we ask in Jesus' name. I was reading an article today, um, earlier today, I just happened upon it and it was in Psychology Magazine. In fact, it's called Psychology Today and it's an online magazine. And the author of this particular article, he asked the question about eternal life. He said, what eternal life? Are you sure? <laughs> and, and so, and in fact, there's a subscript under his name, which uh, talks about the secular life, secular life. And so it, it indicates, seemingly indicates, and I, I think, um, it's, it's true that he approaches life now and life in the hereafter through the secular lens, through the lens of his humanity and not through the lens of scripture as God has revealed it. He goes on to write in this article, um, he quotes in fact, what, um, what is this, this new book written by Martin Haglund, I think I'm saying his name right, but in, in this uh, new book, he calls it The Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom. He talks about the sad, how sad eternal life will be. He, he, he says, it's no more, this is what Haglund says, as a secularist, as a man-centered believer, 
He believes in the significance of humanity and not in the significance of divinity. He says from a, a secular perspective, he says that eternal life is no more than a vortex. Think of a vortex. It, it's shaped like a V and it's sort of circling around. It's like what happens when, when you take the plug out of the sink and the, the, the water forms a vortex. Well, he calls, he calls this idea of the eternal life a vortex of emptiness and suffering. <laughs> wow, how sad, how absolutely sad that humanity from his perspective has nothing to look forward to beyond this life. And that in their words, all that there is worth living for is now and not in the hereafter. How sad, how sad. Well, you know, Jesus about 2000 years ago burst that bubble. <laughs> he, he, he shot that argument down about 2000 years ago. There's so much more to life, incredibly so, infinitely so, when we look at life through the lens of the Word of God and through what we've been talking about for a number of months now, a Christ-centered biblical worldview. That's, that's the only way to look at reality, to look at it any other way. Yeah, you're looking at a vortex of emptiness. There is no other, no other path to life and the enjoyment of life other than through Jesus Christ, a biblical Christ-centered worldview. So with that, um, we're, we're looking at this, this wonderful concept of, of um, the resurrection here in Matthew chapter 28. And, and I'm going to be reading some other texts as well. So um, keep your, your traveling shoes on. Uh, we're going to be sort of making our way both in Old Testament passages, but a couple of New Testament passages as, as well. Here in Matthew 28, we were, were reading it earlier. You, you recall that Mary and the other Mary came to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Now, the earthquake was happened in order to remove the stone. The angel caused the earthquake, to, the earth to quake in the moving of the stone. He didn't move the stone to let Jesus out. He moved the stone to let Mary and the other Mary in. Jesus had already vacated the borrowed tomb. He was not there. That's exactly what the angel said. Come see where he lay. He's not here. In one other gospel, he said, the God, one of the angels said, why are you looking for he who is alive among the dead? Why are you in this, this place of death looking for the living? He is not here. Jesus had already vacated the tomb. He, the angel moved the stone to allow Mary to see in. And eventually the other disciples were able to look into the tomb as well. Um, the, the scripture goes on to say that here in verse 3, this angel, his countenance was like lightning and his clothing was white as snow and the guards shook for fear of him and they became like dead men. So this, this angel was no slouch. He, he, he was not, not, not some, you know, when, when you look at angels today, um, what, what people portray, you know, the little I, uh, images of, of little angels sitting on somebody's shoulder or it, it's just silly, silly, silly images of what angels are in, in reality. They're powerful, powerful beings. And rightly so, the Romans that were there fell as dead men because of one angel. They were afraid of the angel. 
the next verse says, and, but the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he is risen. As he said, come see the place where he lay. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Jesus was making his way to Galilee. And clearly, he was not in the tomb. The angel said, he is risen. The concept of uh, resurrection is the cornerstone of our faith. It is the foundation of our faith. In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he argues that, and this is his argument, this is his logical argument as if he's standing in a courtroom, he is demonstrating to the jury why faith in Jesus as the living Lord, that it is, it is absolutely the right logical conclusion that Jesus is alive and that we preach a risen Lord. Paul argues this and he in fact demonstrates, he says that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the very heart of our preaching. It's why we preach. It's why you're listening this morning. It's why I'm talking. It's why we're gathered in this Zoom space because he's alive. It's the foundation of our worship. If Jesus is not risen, there's no sense in preaching. There's no sense in worshiping. And in fact, there's no sense in expecting him to return, to come back. If he's not alive, we have no message of hope. We have no message of hope. We are, are no more, as then, then Haglund says, we're, we're mixed up and we're in a vortex of emptiness, meaninglessness. Paul said it this way, if there is no resurrection, then we above all men are most miserable. If he's not alive, then the New Testament is pointless, it's empty, it's hollow. All 27 books of the New Testament were, were written, the New Testament, the, the Gospels, the letters, the Book of Acts, all of it's based upon the risen Lord. And if he's not alive, all of it is hollow, meaningless. The New Testament, our faith, our worship, the expectation that Jesus will come again is dependent upon the risen Lord. He is alive. And if he's not, then we have no basis for preaching. We have no basis for worship. We have no basis for expecting him to return. And in fact, what it demonstrates is that Jesus has lied to us. If he's not alive, then that means Jesus is a liar. That means that we're believing that he is alive when in fact, he's not. If he's not alive, then he's a liar. <laughs> but hallelujah, Jesus is no liar. Jesus walked out of the tomb because he is the God man. You see, the resurrection of Jesus is essential to our faith and practice. And yes, there are those who doubt and, and argue from a scientific perspective. Well, how does a scientist prove or disprove there is no life after death? Okay. Let's see, what's your microscope? What microscope will you use to examine life after? They have no means of examining life after death. Haglund, in his, in his uh, summary of eternal life as being a vortex of emptiness and suffering, he is speaking from a lens of secularism in his own mind. That's all he can come up with. Well, eternal life is far beyond humanity. It is what it is, it is the, the place God inhabits. It's a divine reality. And it takes a divine revelation to make the reality of eternal life known. This concept of 
of the resurrection is not only a concept that speaks about living again, but it is the, the, what's taught in the scriptures. The concept of the resurrection is, a, is profoundly, profoundly significant. I mean, it is the most important reality that you and I could ever face. That death ultimately is overcome. Death can be destroyed. Death will die. That's what we're talking, it's profound that one day death will be disposed of because Jesus is alive. We don't need a fountain of youth and we don't need scientists to freeze our body in some cryonic state until they find a cure for all the diseases. That is so silly. The Lord himself has overcome the tenacious grip of death and the grave and says to all who believe, because I live, you too shall live. In just, just to give you some examples of some of the Old Testament passages, there's, there's one in Job chapter 14, where Job, in, in, in thinking through the idea, in fact, he starts out uh, Job chapter 14 and, and says, man that is born of a woman is of a few days and they're full of trouble. Job talks about the essence of, of his reality. He did suffer. He is suffering. At, at this point in his life, and, and he's, he's overwhelmed with suffering. And he writes and he speaks about this, this uh, suffering that he's going through. And from that lens, man that's born of a woman is full. His days are full of trouble, even as the sparks fly upward. But he argues, he goes on in Job 14 and says, there is hope of a tree in Job 14, he says, even a tree, if it is cut down, that it will sprout again and that its tender shoots shall not cease. And I can say amen to that. Out here in front of my yard, the, the county cut down trees that were out in the, what they call the uh, easement, the county easement. And they had trees growing out there and they came along and cut the trees down and they didn't, they didn't kill the roots or the stump. They came back and, and eventually killed the stump, took the stump out. But guess what? In my front yard, all of these tree roots were still growing. And guess what? They're looking for water. They were looking for water. And I know where they were going. They were going, they were heading toward our water lines. And, and I, I, I had a friend of mine who lives up the street he came with his bobcat, tore up our yard, dug up all of these roots. I couldn't believe the rooting system of these trees. It is incredible. All because these tree roots, even though the tree was gone, the roots still sought water. And that's what Job says. Job said, even a tree will sprout again even though its root may grow old in the earth and its stump may die in the ground, yet at the scent of water, it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. My yard was filled of these little trees all over the place. <laughs> and then Job goes on to say, but man, in contrast to a tree, man dies and he wastes away. And then he asks this question, if man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time, I will wait, Job says, until my change comes. He, he didn't have the benefit of revelation that you and I have. He didn't have the benefit of, of looking back on, on, on Jesus who walked out of the grave. He asked the question out of the minimal um, revelation that he had. It was his hope. It was his aspiration that he could live again. Jesus is the answer to Job's expectation. In fact, Job, in, in, in Job chapter 19, Job chapter 19, listen to this. He says, 
I know, Job chapter 19, verse 25 through 27, Job says, for I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And after the skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh, I shall see God, whom I will see for myself and not for another. Job expected a resurrection. So the little revelation that he had from God, he had a profound anticipation of a resurrection. He knows that his Redeemer lives. Yes, in answer to Job's question, if a man dies, shall he live again? Yes. This, this idea of the resurrection, in fact, the word itself means to stand again. Anastasius is, is the uh, Greek word. Ana means again. Stasia means to stand. Anastasia is the name often. It, it means just to rise up and stand again. Listen to this passage in, in uh, Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to read several verses there. Matthew 12, starting with verse uh, 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered and said to Jesus, teacher, we want to see, think of this, we want to see a sign from you. How absolutely, uh, what are they trying to prove? What are they trying to do? Why are they calling him teacher when they really don't believe in him? And he knows their heart. He knows this. But look at it, look at how he answered. But he answered and said to them, an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. I'm going to pause there a moment. Here are these, these uh, Pharisees. They had just witnessed Jesus with, um, healed a man with a withered arm. Healed him. They, they, they saw him heal the man with a withered arm, and then they blamed him because he was working. He's, he did that on the Sabbath. Really? <laughs> he healed a man on a, on a Sabbath, and, and, and they, they accuse him of breaking the Sabbath. And, and now they call him teacher. Not only that, but they witness that he cast out a demon, out, demons out of a man here in chapter 12. And they yet they still ask him for a sign. Oh, get out of here. They don't want a sign. What are they after? They're, they're constantly attempting to irritate Jesus and cause him an unrestful spirit. They want him to do something so that they can have some credible argument why we should not believe that he's the Messiah. And yet all along, all of the proof, all of the, 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 he just keeps banging them with more proof and more proof, more proof that he's the Messiah. And they ask him, well, can you give us a sign? Another, just one more, one more, really? And Jesus said, you're, you're, in a, you're, you're, you're an evil and adulterous generation. Evil. Their hearts weren't right. They didn't, they didn't really want to know. And even today, there are people who, who feign pretend to love Jesus or the things of God. And, and they don't, they don't, no. They're not genuine at all, not at all. But they're after, they're after some, some sense of, of, of proving God isn't all that. Jesus isn't all that. They're attempting to disprove and to take away from the validity of who Jesus is. He calls that an evil and an adulterous generation. That's the generation we're living in. We're living in a, a wicked and an adulterous, evil generation that keeps on rejecting the supremacy and the authority of Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. But this generation keeps on rejecting his word and his people and the anticipation that he will come again. They're scoffers. Jesus ran into this group. He called them an evil and an adulterous generation, the Pharisees. And he said, there's no sign. I'm not going to give you another sign except one. Jesus said, "I'm go all right, you want a sign? Here it is. It's the prophet Jonah. And then he went on. Look, look at verse 40. He went on to say, 
For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Wow. Wow. Incredible. This, this idea, he, he talks about three days and three nights. There, there is this Old Testament, um, what we're calling, I'll call it a commentary. It's called the Talmud. In the Talmud, the Talmud is uh, rabbinic rabbis who write and explain the Old Testament law. So if, if you imagine the five books of Moses, and then you have in the Talmud, you have the Midrash, and you have the Gemara. What these are? These are no more than than common Old Testament commentaries written by rabbis explaining what is in or what and how to believe in the law of Moses. That's the Talmud. Well, in the Talmud, the Talmud explains this idea of three days. What's up with this three days? Well, the Talmud suggests this. Now, this is um, Jewish tradition. The Jews believed that the three you need three days to certify an actual death. If 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 in order to certify that a person was dead, we had we had to leave him in the tomb for three days. If because according to the Talmud, there were instances when when men came out of the tomb they weren't dead they hadn't been real they weren't really dead they didn't really die they survived somehow or another but the talmud says in order to certify that they're dead we have to leave them in three days well that that's an old testament tradition but then it there there are these passages of scripture that speak i mean in the word of god that speak about the three days in Exodus, for instance. Look, look with me at Exodus chapter 19. And I just want, want you to see this. It's in the word of God. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 19. In chapter 19, Exodus, the scripture says this, and I'm reading from, um, I'm starting at verse 10. In verse 10, Exodus 19, then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people, consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. So the concept of the third day is part of not only Jewish tradition, but the Jewish scriptures. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 says, and he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. The, the third day was part of the Old Testament. Look at Jonah. In fact, look at Jonah chapter one. This is the very, this is the very, the very passage, the very section of the Old Testament prophet Jonah that Jesus is referred to. He says in, in Jonah chapter one, verse 17, the Bible says, and the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. In Hosea, in Hosea chapter six, verses one through two, come, let us return to the Lord. Hosea, the prophet says, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken us, but he will bind us. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live again. So the Old Testament speaks about three days. Jesus, what does he do? He takes the concept, whether it's traditionally based or whether it's scripturally based, he takes the three days and says, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so the son of man, will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So the three days and three nights were there to validate that he was dead. Three days, three nights. Jesus fulfilled the scripture. They asked for a sign. And so the sign was Jonah. Jonah's experience in the whale became the validation for Jesus 
the certification that Jesus himself would spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The significance of the, the resurrection is, is profound in that a secularist thinks it, it is a vortex to expect eternal life is no more than a vortex of suffering because they expect what has gone on in life, in, in life, in human life, human experience, all it's gonna do is continue into eternity. He says, he argues the best thing that could happen to humanity is that you die and, you, and, and, and just be totally annihilated and decimated, no eternal life, just, just gone forever into oblivion. That's, that's their expectation. Well, Jesus stood again. He, he came, uh, yes, to die and to be buried and to rise again. In his resurrection, in his resurrection, he declares, he declares to you and I that because I live, Jesus says, you will live also. And I, I'm so grateful today that all of our um, preaching, all of our singing, all of our labor, all of our expectation is, is what it is today because the tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. And, and what, what a wonderful, wonderful joy is ours um, that even the death of our loved ones, he has the, the sweetness, the sweetness of, of the anticipation of seeing them again is, is part of the resurrection, is part of what, what we expect to see. And yet that's, is, that is not the fullness of our expectation. The fullness of our expectation really is found in seeing Jesus, the risen Lord himself. Job said, my Redeemer lives, and in the latter day he shall stand upon the earth. Daniel chapter 9 says that Jesus is coming back to the Mount of Olives. He will stand again upon the earth. Job said, I will see him, and I'm going to see him not for others. I'm going to see him for myself. I trust that's your hope today, precious ones. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful to you for the wonderful, wonderful Son of God, the Lord Jesus and the, the incredible reality of his victory over death, over the grave, and certainly over hell itself. And I thank you again for your spirit and for the, the promise, the promise, the precious promise that is ours of life beyond this, this earthly veil. And it is that, it is such a thin veil. But there's life, not a vortex of suffering, but in an incredible cascade of joy, an anticipation of joy and beauty beyond imagination because of Jesus. And we thank you and worship you this wonderful afternoon. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Maybe there's some in our midst, Father, who don't know you authentically and genuinely, and we pray that your spirit would bring a sense of conviction, a sense of, of need and desperation for Jesus Christ, and that they will call upon you, that they will be convicted for their sin and call upon you and turn to the Lord who can save them from their sin and from their damnation in hell. I pray that they will call upon you. If you're there and, and you want Christ, you know you need him as a savior, the only savior. We want to help you to come to a place where you can confidently say, I know my redeemer lives.